been a good past week. God is good all the time. You know, we live in a realm where physicalities plays a major role in blocking the attempts that God has been making for centuries, and that is getting man to come back to him. You see, last time I was here, I didn't get a, it was so much commotion going on with the mice and everything, I didn't even get a chance to, to say the title of my lesson. <laughs> but it was the throne of God. And today, we're going to be discussing uh, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read from verses 1 through 4. And I want to thank the congregation here and the leadership here for giving me the opportunity to present and feast from the word of God because our God loves for his people to feast. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge. I want you to remember that. Knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. The occasion of this book was for uh, the harm that was being done to the church by false teachers who were of two classes. You have the class of the Libertines and you have the class of mockers. The Libertines were a uh, people or a person, especially a man who behaves without moral principles or a sense of responsibility, especially when it comes to sexual matters. Then you have those mockers who mock at uh, the word of God or someone or something as we have in uh, Second Peter chapter 3 where they talk about uh, the scoffers scoffing at the word of God concerning his coming. But what they fail to understand that a day to the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Where God is from, God is from eternity. He created time. So he looks into this time a little bit different than we see it. So the purpose of this book was to encourage, to exhort the Christians to grow and to warn them of these false teachers. The book of Peter was probably written between 64 in 68 AD, we know it was before AD 70. And my first point I want to look at is the gospel which transforms men. Comparing Peter, we find in the gospel and the new Peter, we find in the book of Acts and in Peter's epistles, we can truly see Peter was transformed by the Holy Spirit, 
according to the way that he wrote the gospel. You see, the man who once argued with his peers about who was the greatest now speaks of himself as a bond servant of Christ. A bond servant, one who is devoted to another to the disregard of his own self-interest. That's how we look out for the kingdom of God. The man who sought to rebuke his Lord and to prevent him from suffering is now a man who writes of the glory of his suffering and of ours as well in 1 Peter, the book, 1 Peter. The man who would not evangelize the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 and 11 when God showed him the vision concerning foods that was shown in his scene. And he refused to eat. And the Lord said, you do not call anything that's unclean that I have made clean. Given a representation to the Gentiles. The man who would not evangelize the Gentiles, not only that, he thought that the converts were second class saints. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. He also speaks of them as being equals now in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. The verses we just read. Peter indeed was not the same man we saw in the Gospels compared to his epistle and the book of Acts. You see, we can look back at Peter when Jesus tells uh, foretells of his death and resurrection in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed on the third day, be raised up. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Sometimes we can become a stumbling block to people when we focus so much on things of the world instead of things that pertain to life and godliness. Jesus foretells of Peter's denial in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31 through 34. Simon, Simon, he says it. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sip you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you knew me. So, Satan desires to sift all the disciples of the Lord, but he can't do anything without the permission of God, as in Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1 through 4 or 5, where Zechariah was presented before the Lord. He was in filthy rags, and then you have Satan, who is the accuser, the adversary come accusing him. But the Lord took care of that problem. And also in Job chapter 1 and verse 2, we see how that the Lord told Satan, have you noticed my upright servant, Job? He said, if I, you, let, you allow me to do this and that to it, he'll cuss you to your face. You see, God will only allow the things that happened to us whereby we may be able to overcome. He's not gonna give us more than we can handle. 
You see, Peter was transformed by the gospel. The gospel did not just transform Peter. The gospel is the means by which God intends to transform every believer. Only we have faith. Every believer. It delivers us from the corruption that is in the world through lust and transforms us into the image of our Lord so that we become partakers of his divine nature, according to verse 4, as in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God and all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for this for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified, made us righteous. And in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Believe that. Believe that we are children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, present tense. Now we are. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because he shall see, we shall see him as he is. And everyone who <clears throat> thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Second Corinthians chapter three and verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. First Peter chapter one, verse 13 through 16. Therefore, after saying all that we have just spoken of, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Knowledge, ignorance. Remember that. To your former ignorance. Okay? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in some of your conduct. Pretty hard to be holy in all of your conduct, huh? <laughs> That's a tough one. But the Lord said we can do it. If we really concentrate and think about it, we can do it. We can be holy in all of our conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God is not planned. Next point, the gospel, which leads to discipleship. The gospel is about man's deficiencies in God's sufficiency. God is able to do far above and beyond all that we ask or think. He is sufficient. It is about God's provision for life and godliness, which man accepts as a gift of grace in Christ. As my brother Angelo did not too long ago, when he was baptized into the body of Christ for the remission of sins, he is on his way in the divine nature of God. Glory be to the Lord. Man contributed absolutely nothing to the salvation. It was all because of what Christ has accomplished for us. For it is the work of God in Christ. While man may not strive to contribute to their salvation, they are challenged to strive to grow in their walk as disciples of our Lord. That is what we are to do. The gospel of verses one through four is the basis of, 
of Peter's charge in uh, verses 5 through 7, as we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. This is the charge, is what we must do. God is the one who sets the loss and undeserving on the path to salvation. The path becomes, for the believer, a path of discipleship. We must disciple people. We must tell people about the life that we have in Christ where we diligently strive to please him as we appropriate the resources he has provided for us in the scriptures. You see, the false gospel of the false teachers leads to the life of self-indulgence. The gospel of the apostles leads to self-discipline and self-denial. What shall it profit a man if he gain the world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. See, a lot of people give, give their souls away. You see, those who have trusted in him who died on the cross are those who are willing to take up their cross, their own cross, and follow him. As Paul told the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affections for the sake of his body, that is his church. We have so many people that's uh, talking down on the church of Christ saying is this, saying is that. It's just what the scriptures has told us what would take place in the latter days, how scoffers will come mocking and scoffing after their own own ungodliness these are people who have not the spirit of the lord read about them in the book of jude they have not the spirit of the lord it is not that we have done anything to obtain salvation according to our works and everything but it is through the obedience of hearing gospel as in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in these. You see, I'm coming to my conclusion. That which stands out clearly in our text is the deficiency of man and the sufficiency of God. Man needs a savior. God has provided everything for us that pertains to life and godliness. You see, man is unrighteous. An unrighteous man will not be acquitted in the sight of God if he thinks that he can do it outside of the body of Christ. Can't do it. And then he may want to ask you, well, how do I get into the body of Christ? And then we start the conversation. God is righteous and, and he offers righteousness to men in Christ. You will be acquitted of all of your sins in Christ and in Christ only. Man is corrupted by worldly lust. You see, it is the lust that is apart from the knowledge, closely related to the emphasis on man's poverty and God's provision is the important role of knowledge. You see, of knowledge. Knowledge is referred to in verses 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8. Whenever man departs from God and from divine revelation, he is what? Ignorant. This man is ignorant. Ignorance is the opposite of knowledge, and ignorance is deadly. Just because you don't know something don't mean that you're going to be uh, free from it. 
if you try drinking some deadly poison in a glass and saying, well, I didn't know it was in there. It's too late. That's why we have signs on drugs and, and uh, cleansing stuff and, and airplanes and buses and street lights and everything. If you, if you want to be ignorant and just walk out in front of a car knowing that the car is coming, I saw something like that last night in real life. See, is this lady going to stop or what? She just going to keep walking? And then she stopped. She realized that so ignorance can be very dangerous. You see, in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, Peter told the Jews that when they murdered and disowned the Holy and Righteous One, the Prince of Life, they acted in ignorance. You see, they acted in ignorance. Likewise, the other tree of the pagan, the Athenians, was ignorant. In Acts chapter 17, verses 23 and 30, Paul speaks of the ignorant unbelief of the Jews in Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, and of his own ignorance as he persecuted the church. Paul did what he did in ignorance. He didn't know. He thought he was doing the will of God. So many uh, billions of people today think they're worshiping the Lord, and they're doing it in ignorance. Is God going to overlook the ignorance? Well, he overlooked it. At one point, but now has commanded all men everywhere to repent. God is not overlooking ignorance anymore, you see. So, Paul persecuted the church, which he speaks about in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Later in 2 Peter, we are told that false teachers are willfully ignorant of the reality of divine judgment in history. We, we see that in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. See, ignorance is not bliss. It is death. That's what ignorance is. Death, you will die. The New Testament instructs us that the cure for ignorance is knowledge. See, let us note the emphasis on knowledge in verses 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8 in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 2. My grace and peace be multiplied. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellency. Verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. Verse 8, for these qualities are yours, these qualities are yours, and are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in what? The knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I take this to be doctrinal knowledge. For it certainly is knowledge of God and knowledge from God. You see, it is scriptural knowledge and it is true knowledge as opposed to false knowledge. You see, this is the knowledge that protects the believer from false teachers and their teachings. You see, the knowledge is also the means by which grace and peace are multiplied to us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Everything pertaining to life and godliness is granted to us through the knowledge of him who called us in verse 3. Knowledge is one of the virtues the Christian should diligently pursue. Verses 5 and 6, we also see from the scriptures that knowledge of God leads to an intimate relationship with him. As Paul told the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul told him that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. So I ask you, my friend, do you know God or are you still ignorant? Are you still ignorant? The way to know God is through his, his holy word and through the word incarnate, Jesus Christ, according to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 14, and the word became flesh. 
To know Christ is to know God and to have an eternal life. If you are a Christian, my question to you is a little bit different. You see, do you, more, do you know more of him today than when you first believed? Do you? Do you? Is there evidence of continued growth in your life? Got to be some kind of evidence. If it's not, it should be. For God is infinite and our knowledge of him in this life will never be complete. You see, are you one that says, but we should be constantly growing as we feast on his word in fellowship with other believers. This message is about the gospel as defined by Peter and the apostles. If you are a Christian, you may think you have already dealt with the gospel. Therefore, you do not have to consider this message at all. You see, that is wrong thinking. You should not be thinking like that. The gospel is not just for the, uh, the truth we believe. It is not just for the truth we proclaim to the lost. The gospel is the truth we live here on earth. That's what the gospel is. Therefore, as you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Because the gospel is the truth, it is under constant attack by Satan, the accuser, the adversary, by our culture, and by false teachers. We must understand this. Therefore, after saying all of that, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you may know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. You are Christian here today. And you stand in need of prayer, we will pray for you. And if you are not a Christian, if you have not been baptized into the body of Christ, we have water. It's always a good thing to have water because it is in obedience to what you hear and your actions stand true. And you obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to thank the congregation here for giving me this opportunity today. And I sing the song that has been selected in our hearing.